Okay, so this is section two uh, of chapter 14 on the Holocaust. Um, let to skip over that. So <clears throat> anti-Semitism um, is a movement or a um, school of thought, which is obviously uh, against uh, the Jewish population. Anti is meaning against. Semitism is a word that is um, more representative towards the Jewish population, although its origins were mostly just about people from the Middle East. So the term anti-Semitism comes from, you know, the uh, mostly used in the latter part of the 1800s. And it's really just an overall um, prejudice or persecution of, of Jewish people. Um, and it, it, you know, persecution against the Jewish population is not uh, a, a, a Hitler thing. It's not a World War two thing. It's something that, that you know, has um, elements that goes way back into biblical times. Um, so it's not a, uh, it's not a new thing in, in relative to, uh, you know, to history itself. Uh, in Mein Kampf, we know that um, Hitler had uh, expressed his views um, of his uh, ideal of um, Aryan super uh, superiority. Um, expressed his hatefulness of the Jewish uh, population, felt like they were uh, responsible or partly responsible for, um, you know, the defeat of Germany during World War I. Um, you know, the whole thing behind that persecution of Jews and, and throughout history is, you know, there's, there's a, a school of thought that the Jewish population has no loyalty towards a certain country. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned before, you know, if, if you're Italian, you're from Italy. If you're Dutch, you're from the Netherlands. Um, you know, if, um, you know, if you're uh, American, you're from the United States. But if you're Jewish, you know, you really don't have a homeland. Now, some people would say Israel, but, um, you know, which I guess partly is true. But as a country, it, Israel is relatively new. It only was formed in, in 1948 as a actual um you know, country that was that the United Nations had created. So <clears throat> there's always that concern that, um, you know, during in, in, in speaking specifically to uh, Germany, um, that the people uh, who were Jewish living in Germany were not Germans; they were Jewish people living in Germany. Although it's not true, I and mean, there's evidence that, you know, some some people in Germany who were Jewish were very nationalistic in their feelings towards Germany as a country. Um, so it's a little background information as to why people always feel like Jewish people don't have a loyalty to a certain country. Um, 1933, Hitler becomes chancellor um, of, uh, of Germany. Um, it, it wasn't like he was elected or anything. It's just that um, the, the Nazi party, which Hitler was part of and was a leader in that party, had gained the uh, majority um, within the uh, parliament of Germany, the, the Reichstag, I believe it's called. Um, probably not pronouncing that correctly, but close enough. Um, and uh, as when von Hindenburg um, had passed on, um, you know, Hitler was was naturally next in line to take over. Um, and by uh, April of 1935, um, the Nazi party had instituted what were called the Nuremberg Laws. These were laws that um, institutionalized a lot of the anti-Jewish theories that Nazi ideology had, you know, had been following. Um, it limited uh, Jewish people's ability to enjoy citizenship. Uh, they couldn't marry outside their religion. They couldn't uh, attend public schools, um, you know. And as you move on into the latter part of the 1930s, even uh, their businesses were uh, attacked. If they owned a business, they were subject to being um, taken away from them. And, and as a result of this, there is a, a certain element, a certain population who had the means to do it of Jewish people in Germany who left um, and returned, um, and that didn't return, but they moved on to other parts of Europe to get away from this persecution. Um, a lot of people stayed because either they thought, oh, this is just a thing that's going to pass eventually, or they didn't they have financial means to be able to, you know, pack up and, and move out. Um, and you'll see that to be a thing uh, moving on here towards the latter part of the 1930s, early 1940s. So as I mentioned, the Nuremberg Laws excluded German, uh, or, I'm sorry, excuse, excluded Jews from uh, citizenship, um, uh, prevented them from marrying any person of German descent, German blood, 
uh, derive them of their voting rights and other political rights. Uh, and, and if you're going to um, if you're going to persecute a, a population like this, you have to identify who is and who isn't. Um, and so there was a process that they went about. And you can see the picture there. Uh, they did things as primitive as, as measuring people's noses. You know, the, the stereotypical um, view on, on Jewish people is that they have large noses, apparently. Um, and it, so it wasn't necessarily a, a religious thing. It was, you know, are you defined as a Jew from, from a, a racial, even ethical standpoint? Um, they also look back at your family. If, if you're grandfathers and grandmothers were identified as Jewish, then you were considered Jewish. And again, it didn't necessarily have to be a, a religious type of um, identification. It was just more, quote unquote, you, you were Jew. Um, term Holocaust, by the way, is, was not a thing that was called during the Holocaust. It wasn't called that until a little bit later on when, when the historians look back at it. Um, but the word is, is of Greek origin. It means sacrifice by fire. Um, and if you want a definition, it's a systematic, and that's an important word, systematic, state-sponsored, another important term in the definition, persecution and um, elimination of approximately 6 million Jews during the Nazi regime during the late latter part of the 1930s and throughout the early part of the 1940s, up through 45. Um, systematic in that there was a process that, that the, that the uh, Nazi party followed, they, you know, in terms of how you identify them, how they you know, collected them, gathered them, shipped them off to, um, later on in the process, shipped them off to um, specific areas, prison camps, labor camps, death camps, whatever you want to call them. Um, and they were sent there to die for the most part. Um, some of them were sent there to work, but, you know, if you died in the process, oh, well. If you were seen as a benefit to the, to the uh, war machine of Germany, in other words, you could help out making war goods, then maybe you lived a little longer. Um, but if you were elderly or if you didn't have the physical um, abilities to to you know perform a certain amount of labor, then you were probably dead within a day of arriving at, the, at these various camps. Um, the Nazis believed that the Germans were racial, racially superior um, and that they deemed uh, not only Jews, but other people as well as inferior and then needed to be eliminated. Um, from the process. You can see up here in the little caption here, um, if I can move my, well, that's not what I want to do. Um, <clears throat> it says, um, Holocaust forgot 5 million non-Jewish victims. So not only were Jewish people identified and eliminated by the Nazi regime, but also people of other political ideologies, other races, um, you know, other religious beliefs, um, homosexuals, uh, the physically and, and mentally handicapped. Um, there was, you know, as many of those people were uh, eliminated as well as, as Jewish people. Um, you know, not to downplay the fact that obviously the Holocaust is, um, you know, a horrible thing. Um, but in addition to the Jewish population, there was also other people who the Nazis had identified as undesirables, as, as the term was used. Uh, Kristallnacht was the time, uh, it's translated loosely as Night of Broken Glass. It was in reaction to a, an event that had happened, I think, in France, where a um, Jewish youth had, um, you know, rioted or attacked, uh, you know, some, some elements of, of German people in that general region. And as a result, um, over a, a span of a couple of days, um, over 101 synagogues are, are destroyed. If you don't know what those are, those are places of wor worships that worshiping where a Jewish, like a church, like a Jewish church would be a synagogue, like a mosque is for Islam, right? Um, uh, 700 or 7,500 Jewish businesses were destroyed and attacked. Over 26,000 Jews were arrested and sent off to these camps that I had mentioned earlier. Many were physically attacked, beaten, so forth. You can see a picture there. Um, of a Jewish owned business that had been attacked and you know, all the glass had been shattered um, and so forth. Um, so it's just a, it was kind of the, the breaking point for a lot of Jewish people. At that, this point, many Jewish people in Germany kind of felt like this, this fool is not going to stop. Like it's not going away um, and it's not a thing anymore. So now we do have to get out of here. So that resulted in many more uh, Jewish uh, German Jewish people um, 
fleeing out of Germany, trying to find other areas of the world to go to. Uh, many of them went back to uh, their uh, biblical homeland, which would have been Palestine at the time. And that leads into a whole other uh, story relative to the uh, Arab-Israeli Arab, um, um, conflict that is still going on, as you know today, um, and has kind of been a part of history throughout the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Every seems like every month or every couple months, there's some kind of event that occurs in that region that is connected to, you know, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that's going on. Um, the movement of, of Jews back to the, the biblical homeland or um, what eventually becomes Israel was called Zionism. Um, it's a movement that really has its roots in the 18, latter 1800s. Um, and it was believed that um, uh, Theodore um, Herzl, who was an activist, a Jewish activist, believed that the, the Jewish population cannot survive until they have their own nation. That goes back to what I mentioned before about, hey, an, an Italian from Italy and Americans from the United States, where are the Jews from? Um, and he kind of understood that that was a, a thing. And so the even though um, Israel is a nation, you can see the flag there, was created in the latter part of the 1940s, I think 1948, you know, post-World War II. Um, the, the talk of that, the creation of, of Israel, uh, as as Israel or Jewish homeland has been talked about as, as early on as the latter part of the 1800s. Um, uh, you know, the, the ideal of it was actually brought up by the British who were in control of Palestine at the time. Um, in the uh, early 1900s, they had uh, designated um, the need for that type of homeland. So um, those people who, who fled Germany to get away from Nazi persecution, a lot of them ended up in other parts of Europe but uh, another significant population shift was uh, many returning to what is today called Israel, but at the time was, was part of Palestine. Um, the, the Balfour Declaration was actually the, 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 the political um, document, the political ideology that created um, the British homeland that was, um, it didn't physically create it, but the idea of developing a homeland for uh, the Jewish people in what at the time was British controlled Palestine was brought up as early as 1923. Um, and the process of Zionism uh, was already ongoing. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, the persecution of Jews and the, the, you know, the ongoing Holocaust in, in Nazi Germany just uh, reinforced and put fuel to the, the amount of Jewish settlers who moved uh, back into um, that region of the world. Um, you can see here by the end of World War II, so 1945-ish, almost 250,000 Jewish settlers had moved back to what eventually becomes Israel. Um, Jewish population in Israel increased to about 500,000 by 1945. Today, it's 5.6 million. Now, today, this, this stat comes from 2010 census, so I'm sure it's probably a little bit more uh, than that now. Um, about 43% of the world's Jewish population live in Israel today. Um, you know, it's a relatively small portion of, of the world in terms of population. Even uh, Judaism as a religion is a relatively small religion compared to Hinduism, Christianity, and um, Islam. Uh, but pretty insignificant in terms of historical relevance. Going back to the Holocaust here, um, at the Wannsee Conference in January of 1942, um, a significant portion of Nazi leaders um, met at, at this conference, and they basically said, hey, the plan that we have to eliminate the Jewish people is not going well. Like, it's too long, too expensive, taking a toll on some of the soldiers that we've been assigned to eliminate Jewish people. Like, they had literally had to shoot Jewish people Um in these big pits that they would, and they would line them all up and shoot them one at a time. Um, and that's, that, that's the human element that, you know, when you're shooting someone, if you're shooting a woman who's holding a baby, which there's several pictures of that um, in Google, um, and uh, obviously a horrifying thing for a person to do that. Um, and if you're asking a soldier to do that over and over and over again, that takes its toll, regardless of the brutality of, of, uh, of how Jewish, or I'm sorry, how Nazi Germany was conducted, they're still human and they're still people. And they, and they, 
you know, and so they felt like that was really taking a toll on a lot of the population in Germany that, you know, they were asking them to physically um, kill someone where if you make it a systematic process where you're just gathering people, putting them on trains and shipping them off to these death camps, that's really impersonal, right? And so these individuals didn't see people die. There was people who were responsible for it, but it wasn't so personal. It wasn't so like, I'm looking you straight in the eye and having to kill you type of thing. Um, and that was decided, the final solution um, was decided on at this conference where they decided to go away from, um, you know, actually shooting uh, Jewish people one by one or putting them in these, um, what were, that were like gas cars that would travel around. And it was just wasn't efficient enough for them. It was taking too long. And so this death camp thing came up um, as a result of this. Moving on again, genocide. Obviously, this is what the Jewish people or the uh, Nazis were were uh, trying to accomplish: the elimination of an entire ethnic group or or cultural group, if you want to call it that. Um, uh, and that is not a new thing, um, unfortunately, in society. And it didn't stop there. Um, it happened before the Holocaust, and it's happened, attempted to happen afterwards. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, you talk about the Rwandan uh, genocide in, in Rwanda in the early 1990s. Uh, you could argue uh, the Ar uh, I think in Armenia there was a, an attempted genocide that occurred during or just slightly uh, around the World War II era or World War One era, I should say. So yeah, not a new thing. Um, death camps were is what was created. You can see there's a picture of the rail leading right into a into a death camp. Um, sometimes they were called labor camps. Sometimes they were called concentration camps. Um, but in reality, by the time you get into the middle of World War II, 1942-ish and on, they became basically death camps. You were sent there to die. Um, the average um, time spent at a camp was like uh, something like uh, a day and a half. Like by the time you arrived at the camp, you know, by the middle of the next day, you were you were probably dead. Um, and that was the reason. And, and that was the final solution. That's how they decided they could be more efficient in their way of eliminating the Jewish population by going to these, you know, camps that were constructed all throughout Eastern and even Western Europe during that time period. Okay, I wanna show this video clip. This is from a, uh, a series called Band of Brothers, um, which was on HBO for a while. Um, but this is an example. You gotta realize that again, the Holocaust is not a thing, not a name that was used during World War II, it was something that was it labeled afterwards. Um, and the average American soldier, the average Soviet soldier, had no idea that this thing was going on, like that that the Jew Germans were doing this. There were some high ups within each of the militaries that kind of had an idea that was happening, but the average foot soldier didn't know that that the Germans were doing what they were doing. So this is an example that these are American troops, these are paratroopers that, um, in the process of liberating France, had stumbled upon this this camp and they didn't know what it was. And so you'll hear them kind of interviewing one of the prisoners there, um, or interviewing is probably not the right word, questioning one of the prisoners, trying to figure out, you know, what is this place? What are you guys here for? So I'll let you watch this. Hopefully the audio will, will work and everything will go great. It's actually pretty interesting. More interesting if it works. There we go. So I'm noticing I'm going to run out of time here before the next hour oh, starts. So I'm going to stop this. I'll post this video on, on Google Classroom for you separately. But I'm going to stop here so I can finish up with the lecture. So the Nuremberg trials, uh, once the war ends, these, you know, there's war crimes that are committed, even though it's a war. As I said before, there's, there's, you know, ethics that are supposed to be followed, rules and laws that are supposed to be followed. Like you don't target civilians and things of that sort. Um, 
And so based on the Nazis' actions during the Holocaust, um, several of the Nazi leaders were brought to court, brought to a, a military tribunal, um, which is a, a court system for the military. They operate outside of the, of the legal court system. Um, all the Allied powers were supplied judges, you know, Great Britain, France, the Soviet Union, and the United States. And many of them were brought up on charges um, for committing war crimes. Um, 22 major Nazi criminals were brought up on charges. A lot of them escaped. Some of them committed suicide. Um, but they were able to, to identify 22 of them. Of the 22, 12 of them were sentenced to death. Um, most of them tried to use the defenses. They were just following orders. We were just following orders. That was not a, a uh, an accepted um, defense. Uh, you know, even though you're being ordered to commit a crime, you are not to follow that order in terms of military law. Um, of course, they didn't have an option, right? If they didn't follow the orders, they probably would have been shot. But still, the process is the process, right? Um, eventually, um, again, 12 of them are sentenced to death. Many of them are are, are, are sentenced to, to uh, life in prison. Um, Adolf Hitler did not have to face that tribunal because he had allegedly committed suicide in the final days of, of April of 1945. Um, and, and, and a lot of other Nazi officials did the same thing. Um, I think that's Goring right there in the picture. Uh, he was sentenced to death. Um, I think he was head of the Luftwaffe, if I remember. Anyways, um, so that's, that's you know, it was all. When you, when you commit crimes like that, wars uh, have laws and they have rules and they have rules of engagement. And when people, um, you know, commit these war crimes, uh, you know, they are eventually going to have to face, um, you know, the military tribunals of the countries that they offended. Um so it, it happened also in in, uh, in Bosnia, in Kosovo. Demir Strong Brown, please report to door A. Demir Strong Brown, please report to door A. 